Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar on hepatitis A and B vaccination for gay and bisexual men, innovative practices and new resources. My name is Alyssa Kitlis, and I'm a manager on the hepatitis team at NASDAD. And for those of you who aren't familiar with NASDAD, we are a nonprofit association that supports state and city health department HIV and hepatitis programs through capacity building assistance, as well as advocacy and policy work. And all the work we do is through the lens of social justice. And this webinar is being put on through a partnership we have with the education, training, and communications team at CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis. So we're very excited to be having this important discussion today. And we basically have had a record-breaking number of registrants, um, some, one of the most popular webinars that we've hosted. So we're really grateful to have you on, on board and looking forward to this discussion. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, but we're gonna be talking about it over the next hour, but hepatitis A and B vaccines are specifically recommended for gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, but we're seeing relatively low rates of vaccination among this group. And as I'm sure you also are well aware, we're having a multi-state hepatitis A outbreak in the US, as well as seeing rises of hepatitis B in a number of states. So it is really critical that we're making sure that vaccinations are reaching communities most affected by hepatitis A and B. So today we're joined by five really excellent panelists who are gonna be sharing, um, providing an update about the multi-state outbreak, going over existing hepatitis A and B vaccine recommendations, sharing a little bit about um, a state response in Colorado and how they were able to work with their gay and bisexual male community um, to respond to FA there and introducing some really new and exciting resources from CDC's um, Division of Viral Hepatitis specifically designed for gay and bisexual men. And then we're gonna be wrapping up the discussion and hearing from my colleague, Andrew, about NASA and the work that we do and um, how we can support health departments in ensuring communities most affected are engaged in these efforts. So we're really excited to have all these speakers and I'm not gonna spend too much more time talking because we have a lot to cover in the next hour, but I'm gonna provide a couple quick housekeeping items before we get started. So everyone is joining in listen only mode. So the panelists will be unmuted, but everyone on the line will be muted throughout the presentation, but we wanna make sure to hear from you as well. So there is both a chat box and a question box in your control panel. So please feel free to um, you know, ask questions, share what you're seeing or the work you're doing in your jurisdiction or anything you'd like us to know um, in those two boxes. And we'll make sure to, during the question and answer portion at the end, read out some of the things that are coming in and, and address the questions. And if we can't get time, get to it at the end because we don't have enough time, we'll make sure that we follow up and um, get you responses to the questions that you have. And this webinar is being recorded and both the recording and the slides will be sent out following um, the webinar to all the participants. So you'll be able to access it if you're not able to stay for the whole presentation or wanna see some of the materials on the slides following. So additionally, if you have any other housekeeping questions, we'll make sure to address those in the chat box as well. So as I mentioned, we have five really excellent speakers and I'm gonna briefly introduce them before turning it over to Monique to get us started. But we're gonna hear from Dr. Monique Foster from CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis first, and then Dr. Noelle Nelson, also from DVH, and then Nicole Comstock from Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and Amanda Carnes from CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis, and then um, my colleague Andrew Zatzel from NASA will be um, wrapping up the discussion at the end. And I also just wanted to give a quick shout out to my colleague Jasmine West, who's helping facilitate this webinar today. So thank you, Jasmine, for, for being part of that process. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Foster to get us started. Hi, thanks so much. Um, thanks for having me speak um, and give a brief description on the outbreaks that we've seen happened with hepatitis A in the past two and a half years. Um, next slide. I know that those online are, are pretty knowledgeable about hepatitis, viral hepatitis in general, but just a refresher about hepatitis A. It's an RNA virus member of the coronavirus family. It re 
replicates in the liver and it goes out into the stool through the bile. Um, it's illness is typically acute and limited, unlike hepatitis B and C, there's chronic form. Clinical symptoms are really indistinguishable from acute hepatitis B or C, and the average incubation is about 28 days, but ranged from 15, 1, 5 to 50. Um, there, again, is no chronic phase of this disease, although it can relapse. And an infected person can excrete um, the virus in the stool for up two weeks prior to becoming symptomatic. And that's really what makes identification and exposures um, and initial detective of, detection of outbreaks particularly difficult. Next slide. The United States really became a low demicity country during the second half of the last century. And, and during that time, we used to see cyclic increases in hepatitis A, and those increases would occur every 10 to 15 years or so. Prior to when the vaccine became available in 1996, the number of reported surveillance cases remained on average around 21,000 annually. But when you account for underdiagnosis and underreporting, that actual number is estimated to be at least twice as high. Next slide. Hepatitis A incidence rates have increased dramatically or increased dramatically in the wake of the recent outbreaks. This map shows um, what the incidents looked like back in 2015, and that was the most recent year we had when there were no major outbreaks. Um, at that time, the national hepatitis, hepatitis A incident rate was 0 0.4 per 100,000 population, and that's according to the notif National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System. Um, NOST had an incidence above 0 0.8 per 100,000 at that time. Next slide. Looking at provisional data from NNDSS last year, national hepatitis A incidence rate has increased to 3.8 per 100,000 population. And it really ranged from zero in some states to up to 112 persons per 100,000 population in areas like West Virginia. Next slide. This is the latest national epi curve of all the cases of hepatitis A reported to CDC through NDSS. And just to orient you to the slide, the red dashed line indicates these standard deviations above what was reported in the five years prior to the start of these recent outbreaks. So in, back in those years, CDC received on average reports of 29 cases per week. So you can see we're well above that, that average. Next slide. This increase in incidence really is primarily due to the hepatitis A outbreaks we're seeing among persons who report drug use and homelessness. And we're seeing these outbreaks in at least 25 states currently. I'm often asked why these outbreaks impact these vulnerable populations. Next slide. And really it's because of the this, this shift in hepatitis A virus epidemiology. In the past, when we saw large outbreaks of hepatitis A, they were really associated with asymptomatic children who infected the adults who cared from them. But now we have widespread adoption of the universal childhood vaccination recommendations. Asymptomatic children really aren't the main drivers of hepatitis A outbreak in this country. Although the overall incident rate of hepatitis A infection has decreased within all age groups, we have a, a large population that is not immune to infection because they have not been vaccinated and they were not infected naturally when they were children. So we see a lot of susceptible adults who are exposed either through contaminated food items or through behaviors that increase risk of infection. We know that older individuals are more likely to be symptomatic and hepatitis A infection among older individuals is more likely to result in severe disease and adverse outcomes such as hospitalization, liver failure, and death. There are no universal vaccination recommendations for adults for hepatitis A. And we know that adults at risk for infection, the vaccination recommendations that do exist, these populations, uptake is presumably quite low. Next slide. Outbreaks of hepatitis A have been documented previously among gay and bisexual men here in the United States. And while it's possible that the virus could be transmitted sexually due to its short course of viremia, transmission is more likely due to personal contact and specific sexual practices, notable oral anal or digital anal contact. Viral strains recovered from um, 
MM cases reported from multiple jurisdictions in the U.S. in 2017 were genetically matched to strains causing large outbreaks among gay and bisexual men in Europe. Hepatitis A vaccination has been recommended for men who have sex with men by the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices in 1996, but we don't have a lot of good data on vaccine uptake in this population. Next slide. Luckily, as we all know, hepatitis A is vaccine preventable, and vaccination really is the cornerstone of outbreak control. Reduction in new cases can be obtained and sustained by maintaining a high level of population immunity through vaccination. And controlling large community outbreaks through vaccinating only contacts of cases or through post-exposure prophylaxis is really limited because persons are frequently unaware of their exposure and cases may be reported to public health authorities too late to be effective, so within that 14-day window. Proactive vaccination of groups at highest risk is really what was recommended and what we'd like to see increase. Ideally, these groups would be identified and targeted early in outbreaks, but we know that this can be logically difficult and, and costly. So primary prevention by ensuring these at-risk populations are vaccinated before outbreaks occur is definitely preferable. Next slide. Lastly, a little bit about what CDC has been doing to support states during these outbreaks. We provide technical assistance uh, either remotely here from Atlanta or we go into the field when requested. Um, that can be epidemiologic assistance or support of vaccination outreach efforts. We have calls with impacted states every week. We review EPI and provide guidance on scientific questions about hepatitis A and outbreak response. We engage both federal and national partners to provide information on the outbreak and identify opportunities for collaboration to increase vaccination upon these populations at risk. Um, we work with our colleagues in the Immunization Service Division to ensure that states have access to 317 vaccine and, um, and make sure there are opportunities to apply for additional funding to respond to these outbreaks. Uh, we also conduct additional testing on specimens submitted to our laboratory. And um, what I've pictured there are a few of our educational and communicational materials that we use. Um, I'll let our communications colleagues talk about the materials that are specific for gay and bisexual men. Next slide. And that's just a picture of the team, some of whom are on this call and talking to you today, and um, my contact information in case if you want to reach out. Great, thank you so much for getting us started, Dr. Foster. And now we'll hear from Dr. Noel Nelson at CDC. Um, hello, good, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm gonna give a brief overview of hepatitis A and B vaccination um, for gay and bisexual men. Um, go on to slide uh, two, and then slide three. So Dr. Foster already covered um, most of the information on this slide, but I do want to reiterate that ACIP has recommended routine hepatitis A vaccination of men who have sex with men since 1996. Next slide, please. Two inactivated single antigen hepatitis A vaccines are licensed in the United States. Um, Havrix was licensed in 1995 and back to 1996. They're administered on a two-dose schedule. And there's also a combination vaccine, Twinrix, that includes um, a protection against hepatitis A and hepatitis B. It's um, available in the United States for adults aged greater than or equal to 18 years, and it's administered on a three-dose schedule, as well as an accelerated schedule that's usually used for travelers. Next slide, please. All licensed vaccines are highly immunogenetic in persons aged greater than 18 years when administered according to the recommended schedules. Um, protective antibody levels have been identified um, up to 100% in immunocompetent adults one month after the first dose. Um, protective antibodies may um, rise at a little slower rate in persons who are um, immunocompromised. Um, however, um, once um, their status improves, um, usually um, they respond to vaccine. After the second dose, all persons um, usually have protective levels of antibody um, with high 
um, with a high response. Um, and this is also the same in children. However, I've only shown the information for adults on this slide. Next slide. The vac vaccine protection also lasts for a long time. We think probably lifelong. Um, Antibody um, to hepatitis A virus um, has been shown to persist in vaccine recipients for at least 20 years in adults who are administered inactivated vaccine as children, as well as among adults vaccinated with the two-dose schedule as adults. Detectable antibodies are estimated to persist for 40 years or longer, however, based on modeling studies. And as I said, protection following a natural infection is lifelong and may also be following vaccination. In addition, the single dose of hepatitis A vaccine can persist for almost 11 years, though likely longer. Um, and a single dose of vaccine has been shown to promote um, cellular immunity similar to that induced by natural infection. Next slide. Hepatitis A vaccine is considered safe. In pre-licensure trials, adverse reactions to the single antigen as well as combination vaccine were mostly injection site reactions and mild systemic reactions. Post-marketing surveillance for adverse events um, has been performed primarily by, by two systems in the US and no unusual or unexpected safety patterns were observed for any of the hepatitis A vaccines licensed in the United States. Next slide. So the hepatitis A um, vaccine recommendations have been introduced incrementally in the United States. They were first targeted um, to children in 1996 through 1999 at age two years um, in communities with high rates of disease as well as in outbreaks. Um, they were also recommended for adults from 1996 to the present, um, high-risk adults only. And then universal um, childhood vaccination was started in 2006 for all children in the United States age 12 to 23 months. There's a permissive catch-up recommendation currently. However, in June uh, 2019, um, routine catch-up uh, was approved by ACI and will become a recommendation once published in MMWR. Next slide. So this slide shows the groups at increased risk of hepatitis A viral infection or severe hepatitis A viral disease, um, and they're recommended to receive the vaccine. Um, and the year of the recommendation is noted um, next to the risk group. So travelers, men who have sex with men, persons who, inje who use injection and non-injection drugs, and persons with occupational risk for infection were all recommended uh, in 1996. Persons who anticipate close personal contact with an international adoptee was added in 2009. Persons experiencing homelessness was added in 2019. Um, and then um, persons with chronic liver disease are at risk for more severe disease, um, though they're not at increased risk for, for infection. Uh, that was recommended in 1996. And then persons with HIV was approved in June 2019, and that'll also be a new recommendation pending publication. Next slide. So um, vaccine coverage in the United States. Um, as Dr. Foster noted, um, we do not have um, very good data um, estimating uh, vaccine coverage among men who have sex with men. Adults overall age greater than equal to 19 years is 10.9% um, or greater than equal to two doses. In travelers and those with chronic liver disease, it's higher, up to 20%. If you restrict the age group to age 19 to 49 years, um, the uh, coverage is a little higher. However, if you look at adults greater than equal to 50 years, um, coverage is very is, is little, about 6%. Um, studies that are focused just uh, on MSM, um, we estimate that vaccine coverage is about 40%. Um, one study that looked at a select um, group of MSN in New York City um, in a gym showed coverage up to 70%. And of course, that's really what we would um, prefer the coverage to be uh, overall. So 
So still a ways to go to increase um, vaccine coverage among adults in general for hepatitis A, but also among um, men who have sex with men. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to um, switch to hepatitis B vaccine. Okay. So among adults, hepatitis B virus is transmitted primarily by percutaneous exposure to blood, such as injection drug use and sexual contact. Risk factors associated with sexual transmission among men who have sex with men include having multiple sex partners, history of another sexually transmitted infection, STI, and anal intercourse. Next slide. As many as 10 to 40% of adults seeking treatment in STI clinics have evidence of current or past hepatitis B virus infection. For persons with HIV, approximately 10% of HIV positive persons are co-infected with hepatitis B virus. Chronic um, hepatitis B viral infection has been identified in about 6 to 14% of HIV positive persons, including 9 to 17% of men who have sex with men and 7 to 10% of persons um, who inject drugs. Co-infected persons have increased rates of cirrhosis and liver-related mortality. Next slide. Hepatitis B vaccine was introduced in 1982. It's administered as a three or four dose series starting at birth. The hepatitis B vaccine induces antibody to the hepatitis B surface antigen. And protection against infection is associated with initial antibody concentration of greater than equal to 10 million international units per milliliter after a complete vaccine series. However, we know that this antibody levels wane over time following vaccination, but persons who initially respond to the full three-dose vaccine series and who are later found to have decreased antibody levels um, remain protected. Next slide. This slide shows the currently available licensed hepatitis B vaccines um, in the United States. Um, the, uh, first, for, um, first two are approved um, for use at any age with Combovax and Endurix. Um, Pediorix is a combination vaccine for children, and Twinrix is the combination hepatitis A, hepatitis B vaccine that I mentioned in the hepatitis A part of this talk. Heposav is a new vaccine approved for use in adults greater than equal to 18 years, and it is a two-dose series over one month, and I will describe it on the next slide. Heposav B was FDA licensed in November of 2017. It's indicated for active immunization against infection caused by all known subtypes of hepatitis B virus in persons aged greater than equal to 18 years, two doses over one month, which likely results in improved adherence compared to the three-dose six-month schedule. It uses an adjuvant it's called 1018, which binds a uh, toll-like receptor 9 to stimulate directed immune response to the hepatitis B surface antigen. And more information um, uh, is available um, in the references on this slide. Next slide. So except for Heposav B um, and, and an accelerated twin RICs, the recommended um, vaccine schedule and intervals are shown here. Um, doses at shorter than the recommended intervals um, need to be readministered. Um, and if an accelerated schedule is used for twin RICs, that's at zero, um, seven days, and 14 days, um, a booster um, should be administered um, after the start of the series to promote long-term immunity. So on this slide, you can see that the interval between the first and second dose is um, is greater than equal to four weeks, between the second and third dose is greater than equal to eight weeks, and between um, the first and the third dose has to be greater than equal to 16 weeks. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, similar to, to hepatitis A, hepatitis um, B vaccine also provides long-term protection 
Um, vaccination with a complete series results in protection in greater than 90% of healthy adults aged greater than 40 years. Response decreases with age, but has still been shown to about, be about 75% in persons aged um, 60 years. Data suggests protection against acute symptomatic and chronic infection persists for 30 years or longer among um, healthy persons um, who originally responded to the vaccine. Next slide. Um, hepatitis B vaccines are considered safe um, with um, some frequent side effects or uh, pain at the injection site and fever. Um, and evidence supports association um, of um, anaphylaxis in yeast sensitive individuals only. Next slide. Uh, ACIP um, recommendations for hepatitis B vaccination. Um, I will not read all of these um, indications. However, hepatitis B vaccine is recommended for persons at risk for infection by sexual exposure, persons at risk for infection by percutaneous and mucosal exposure to blood, um, and others um, such as HIV infection. This is a specific recommendation. Um, Next slide, um, as it appears in the ACIP vaccine statement, persons at risk for infection by sexual exposure, example, sex partners of um, surface antigen positive persons, actually active persons who are not in a mutually monogamous relationship, an example, persons with more than one sex partner during the previous six months, persons seeking evaluation or treatment for a sexually transmitted infection, and MSM. Pre-vaccination testing is recommended for MSM. However, this should not be a barrier to vaccination of susceptible persons. Um, usually the first dose of vaccine is administered on the same day immediately after collection of the blood for serologic testing. Um, if the, this testing um, will um, show if the person is actually already um, infected with hepatitis B, and it will also show um, if they've been exposed in the past um, or if they've been um, vaccinated previously. And the last slide um, here, I'm just going to show the, the vaccination coverage among adults age greater or equal to 19 years. Um, it's better than for hepatitis A, um, but still not, um, still definitely suboptimal overall with a 26% um, coverage among all adults, higher for risk groups. Um, estimations for men of sex with men um, really vary among studies from 45% up to 65%. Um, better data are needed, but it's clear that um, increased vaccination among um, MSM is, is needed. Uh, next slide um, has my contact information. And um, thank you again. Excellent. Thank you, Noel. I think that we'll transfer it on over to Nicole, so it's all yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nicole Comstock. I work at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment here in Colorado, and I'm going to talk to you about a hepatitis A outbreak in the gay and bisexual uh, male community in, that occurred in Colorado in 2017. Next slide, please. So Monique did a great job covering kind of the key features of hepatitis A, so I will skip this and go to the next slide. And Noelle just did a great job going through the um, vaccine recommendations, so I'll skip this as well and, and just get into the meat of the presentation here. So like in other states, hepatitis A is a notifiable condition here in Colorado, and you can really see the success story of um, hepatitis A vaccination by looking at our incidence rates in Colorado, which this chart is showing here. So through the 80s and 90s, we would have kind of epidemic years of hepatitis A. A lot of our transmission was thought to be foodborne. Uh, we had quite a few situations in those years where we had 
cases of hepatitis A that occurred in food handlers that then resulted in cases in patrons, as well as quite a few outbreaks in child care centers. Um, once the vaccine became available in 1996, we saw a steady decline. And in the post-vaccine era, we were averaging between 20 and 30 cases reported in our state each year during non-outbreak years. Our low was uh, 21 cases in 2011. Uh, next slide. In Colorado, each reported case of hepatitis A is investigated. Those uh, case interviews are primarily con conducted by local public health agency staff. So that could be epidemiologists, public health nurses, or disease intervention specialists. Um, many of our interviewers at local public health agencies um, have limited experiencing, experience collecting sexual histories. Most of the uh, sexually transmitted infection um, case interviews are conducted by state health department staff. Um, within the state health department here in Colorado, hepatitis A surveillance is conducted by the enteric disease unit. And we are organizationally separated from our STI, HIV, and hepatitis B and C programs. Although recently, the hepatitis B and C programs will be coming under the same umbrella as the um, enteric disease unit. So we'll have a more organizational structure to help with collaboration with those programs. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2017, we saw an increase of hepatitis A cases in our state. Um, I know this, these case counts for that year are small compared to the current outbreaks that, or the recent outbreaks that have been occurring among people experiencing homelessness and substance use issues. Um, but this was an increase in our state. In 2017, we had 63 uh, cases reported, um, about half were hospitalized. We did have one death. These cases primarily uh, occurred in the Denver metropolitan area, which I would, uh, include um, the Colorado Springs area, which is south of Denver um, in that catchment as well. So primarily in the most populated part of our state. 62% um, of our cases that year were male, which is more than we would typically ex expect. And I'll show you a kind of a breakdown of what we would expect to see in a, a future slide. The median age of our cases was 44 years, um, but the range was anywhere from 19 to 83 years. And about a third, at least a third of our cases occurred in gay or bisexual men, um, some of whom report, many of whom actually in that group reported anonymous partners at adult or video bookstores or um, sex with partners met through web or phone apps. This is probably an underestimate of the number of you know, gay or bisexual men in our case counts as uh, many cases that we identified um, were not openly gay or bisexual, um, some of whom were uh, married to female partners um, and had families and um, just were not um, openly gay or bisexual. Um, I would also mention here that uh, this really, this outbreak among primarily affecting this uh, population came to light because of an astute interviewer at one of our local public health agencies who really made the connection of the exposures um, at, the, at a particular chain of adult video stores. So this slide shows our epi curve. We are missing onset date for one of our cases here, but occurred primarily in the um, spring and summer months. Um, next slide. So you can see looking at our hepatitis A cases by sex in Colorado from 2005 through uh, 2017. Um, usually we'll see a pretty even breakdown between um, male and female cases, uh, but certainly a large increase in the number of uh, male cases reported in 2017. Next slide. So our interventions for this outbreak, um, we did post-exposure prophylaxis clinics and vaccination campaigns for our at-risk contacts and groups. Uh, our local several local public health agencies set up clinics um, inside adult video or bookstores and also at other gay and bisexual uh, men gathering places such as um, bathhouses. Um, and at these uh, vaccination campaigns, it was a hepatitis A virus that was offered. It was not twin ricks. Um, our understanding is when you're doing post-exposure prophylaxis or vaccination campaigns in response to an outbreak, it's better to use the um, Hep A vaccine rather than Twinrix because it has um, you, people build up an immune response faster with the Hep A only vaccine as opposed to, to Twinrix. Um, 
we did release several press releases, um, one in May, which was kind of near the beginning of the outbreak, which didn't get a lot of traction. Um, in, in fact, some media outlets, while our press release did clearly state the risk groups um, that we were trying to target for vaccination, um, some media outlets uh, would take that piece out. So it wasn't really clear who the outbreak was affecting. Uh, we did several health alerts to healthcare providers statewide, um, encouraging vaccination among uh, men who have sex with men. Um, we provided training to our local public health interviewers on taking sexual histories and one of our local health departments, Tri-County Health Department, developed a really great uh, training and um, kind of some scenario based training that um, we still use and promote to our local public health agencies um, today. And we added more thorough, thorough and detailed sexual history questions to our hepatitis A case interview form. So we will hopefully have a, a greater likelihood of collecting um, that risk factor information from our cases. Um, next slide. Since our media, um, our press releases weren't getting a lot of traction and not that we felt we're not reaching the groups that we needed them to reach, we convened a group of CDPHE staff who work with gay and bisexual male clients, um, staff who identified as gay or bisexual, and staff who have a health and education health education background to really have a focused um, group to talk about what we we're doing, what we could do better to try to um, better reach these. Um, these at-risk populations. We expanded this group to include partners at local public health agencies to more thoroughly explore um, our what our communication campaign should be. Uh, we held a digital focus group uh, that was um, promoted to gay and bisexual men statewide to share our messaging materials and ask for specific feedback on um, what they thought about the materials, which I'll show you in a couple slides here, and ask for ideas of where we should share the information to reach our targeted audience. Um, as a result from that digital focus group, um, really it was uh, Facebook and uh, other social media sites and then uh, gay dating apps were determined to be the best options for our campaign. So we rounded up some limited funding and um, got uh, leadership approval to do educational campaigns for our risk groups on Grindr, Scruff, uh, which are uh, dating apps, um, Facebook, various Facebook pages. Um, we paid for um, ads on Facebook rather than trying to do the more um, you know, free CDPG Facebook site. We, we paid for more targeted ads. We also had a presence at Pride events, handing out literature. We did not offer vaccine, uh, vaccine at Pride events, but we did um, have uh, information to hand out to attendees. Um, overall, our Facebook outreach, which included paid ads, was able to reach more than 10,000 people outside of our state health department's usual network of followers. Um, the scruff ads we were able to run were free. And um, if you combined our um, metrics for scruff and grinder ads, we had more than 3.5 million impressions resulting in over 6,000 clicks to our um, website that uh, had information about hepatitis A and promoted hepatitis A vaccinations. Um, local public health agencies also worked with community-based organizations to collect, uh, to connect clients to rapid hepatitis C testing and hepatitis A, uh, during hepatitis A vaccine clinics. They also refer clients to the local public health uh, family planning clinics for HIV and STI testing. Next slide. So this just shows um, just an example, the first part of our, one of our press releases that um, the second one we did in August of that year, our outbreak was kind of declining by that point, but um, we did get um, a little more traction with that press release. And then below that is just an example of our health alert that went out um, as well during that year. And next slide. So uh, big thanks to New York City who, um, we set up a licensing agreement to use their, um, it's just a little prick um, hepatitis A vaccination campaign. Um, these are the ads that we posted on Facebook, Scruff, Grinder, and then did more uh, handed out information on this in this campaign at different Pride events. We did have many of our um, uh, educational materials translated into Spanish. We saw, I think, 
this is about I think 40 or no 20 percent of our cases were Spanish speaking in this outbreak so that was important to reach um, to make sure we're getting information to um, people whose primary language is not English and then we also use materials from San Diego's outbreak the, the yellow poster here um, to post at different uh, gay places or social gathering places for gay and bisexual men um, promoting vaccination as well as um, uh, hygiene and hand washing. Next slide. So that's all the information I have. It was a, a relatively, again, small outbreak compared to some of the larger ones where uh, states are investigating now, but um, it was kind of new and innovative uh, communication practices for us and really showed us here in Colorado the importance of really bridging the gap between our viral hepatitis, uh, sexually transmitted infections, HIV groups, and the communicable disease groups that um, per perform hepatitis A surveillance regularly. Um, and the, the group we formed um, for the focus group to really bring these different subject matter expertise together um, still is still meeting to this day and still uh, trying to find ways for us to leverage our resources and work together to um, come up with effective strategies that, to, in reaching um, gay and bisexual men during various types of disease outbreaks. We'll leave it at that. Great. Thanks so much, Nicole. Uh, now we're going to hear from Amanda Carnes at CDC. Hi, good afternoon. Um, as Alyssa said, I'm Amanda. I work on the education training and communications team at DVH. I want to just take a minute to say thank you to my CD colleagues who presented and also Nicole for sharing um, the information on what Colorado was able to accomplish in reaching this very important population. Um, my presentation is going to cover off on the project that we've been working on for the past year. Next slide. And with that project, um, we really were working on um, building some communication products to encourage vaccination and gain bisexual men. Um, the materials developed were all grounded in formative research um, where we got some feedback from st stakeholders and also a limited number of men who have sexual um, who have sex with men as well. Um, the resources available um, are consumer-facing websites, some posters, and digital tools, which I'll show you in just a second. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> um, this is our website that we just um, went live on yesterday, and it's information for gay and bisexual men. It has information on vaccination, and also at the bottom of the page, an overview, um, a chart that has information on A and B, such as how it's spread, um, treatment, and um, also severity of the disease. Next slide. I also wanted to highlight a website that we've had up for um, a while, but this is really geared towards more health professionals and partners, but it really outlines the information that Noelle spoke about on um, the ACI recommendations for A and B, and then also um, some other scientific guidelines and recommendations, linked to MMWRs and other publications, even has some um, health care provider tools that might be helpful um, for people on the call. Um, if at the bottom of this page, that's where you're going to find our resources that we have. Next slide. Um, and this is really where our patient focused resources will be. Um, so again, you see a link to the website um, I just presented. And then also we have available some posters and some digital tools. So next slide. With the posters, I want to highlight we have two posters um, that are promoting A and B vaccination, and each poster has, is available in two different sizes for download and printing. Um, and I wanted to note that in the bottom um, white band, you'll actually have the ability to localize this with information on the A and B vaccination services offered by your organization. So there's a text box that you can type in and also a box that you can upload an image such as a logo as well. So we really wanted to make these materials localizable and customizable um, for your organization and your needs. Next slide. These are the array of digital um, ads and tools that we provided. So they're in four different sizes. Um, one thing I wanted to note is that 
um, image number four. Um, I know Nicole mentioned the effect in the dating app advertising, and we wanted to make sure that we provided partners and content that they could use for this medium. So the ad size number four was specifically sized for dating app and digital ads, um, like those that are uh, required on Grindr and other dating applications. So hopefully uh, you all will find those helpful. Next slide. I wanted to highlight that we do have outbreak communication and education materials, so related to hepatitis A outbreak. There's a public and professional materials. Um, we have materials, fact sheets, pocket cards, posters. We also have tailored materials for people who use drugs, people experience homelessness or unstable housing, and then um, also gay and bisexual men. Next slide. Here's an overview of the materials for gay and bisexual men. There's a fact sheet, a website that um, really looks at um, talking about the importance of vaccination and also kind of providing an overview of the outbreak in um, this population's context. And then there are also posters that are available and they too have the customization feature on the bottom for your um, use. Next slide. I just wanted to say thank you all um, for your time of being on the webinar. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, any of the resources I presented, we would love to hear it. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Amanda. And I don't know if this is easy to figure out, but if you're able to share the link to the um, resource page, the new one from CDC in the chat box, that would be great. And then we'll definitely be sure to send that out and follow up for the webinar as well to make sure people can easily find that. Will do. Thank you. Great. So last but certainly not least, we're going to hear from my colleague Andrew Zapfel about um, health equity, hepatitis, and gay and bisexual men. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Andrew. Great. Thank you so much, Alyssa. And uh, great to hear from all the other uh, amazing panelists on the call today. I've definitely learned a lot of great information and great tools. I want to then thank you for the opportunity to share some of the health equity perspectives we have here at NASDAD. And the following slides and what I'm going to present on today is a very high level approach to some of the core health equity themes and needs that we like to promote as NASA to reach in gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. My contact info is included on the last slide. We are always happy to have a conversation on health equity and providing further resources and strengthening outreach for this population. So you see that the first slide is uh, focusing on the individual level, looking at personal level uh, care and support around cultural responsive care. So here at NASDAQ, you know, we work on the theme around cultural responsiveness versus the continuum where we've seen in the past talking about, you know, being culturally blind in services, that everyone's treated equally, to culturally competent. So now we really want to focus our attention on culturally responsive care, in which it denotes a lifelong commitment to working to better understand different groups of people while acknowledging that one can never be truly competent in someone else's culture. That basically means that as much as, you know, no matter what, even if you attend all the trainings and all the seminars and have all the experiences, you're still always going to be learning about another person's culture, community, um, and aspects. And so it's always important to have that sort of understanding and realize that culturally responsive care is based in humility, collaboration, and an active sense of learning, where it positions both parties, both the patient and the um, and the provider as being able to learn from one another and help each other grow in uh, their understanding of the best needs and uh, support for the client. In practice, what does this mean? We're talking a lot about uh, taking sexual histories and being able to talk about the specific health needs of gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Uh, I links here, and we'll be sending out with the slides, are a number of different research articles that talk about the importance of cultural responsive training and continued accountability mechanisms to ensure providers are taking what they are learning and applying it to their work. One article a few years ago interviewed black, gay, and bisexual men on their prevention efforts for sexually transmitted diseases. And one of them specifically noted how clinics for them were seen as safe spaces to be able to actually talk about their sexual orientation openly. The question always is, is as we're working to make sure that we're creating welcoming environments, are the centers, clinics, and resources that we have available speaking to the needs of the population and creating a space where they feel welcomed and able to talk about their sexual history and ask the questions they need to have to prevent the further uh, spread of sexual transmitted diseases and hepatitis. And next slide. Another level that we like to focus on is around community level engagement. And when there are specifically areas of medical mistrust, lack of engagement in care, general lack of interest, or really not the numbers you want to see in terms of uptake of vaccinations, for example, or other sort of services, there needs to be a renewed urgency to engage community in the services that you provide. 
And Nasta, we always like to say that we have kind of four key questions when it comes to community level engagement, both from all the way to health department level um, at high level jurisdiction to local health departments, as well as at community based organizations. We like to make sure people are asking you who is missing, who is not involved in the conversation that should be, and where everyday decisions are accompanied by you know, public posting or making sure there are numerous different avenues that you're trying to reach out information to populations you're trying to serve questions around how can you or we reach them, requiring really planning and making sure that you're inviting as many people as possible into spaces that are seen as representative of the community, that are seen as welcoming and open, and include sometimes incentives and are using trusted facilitators from the community as well. We'd like to talk then about where are they, you know, making sure that, you know, when we think about populations that are quote unquote hard to reach, that ensuring that the, quote, the population is in itself hard to reach, but maybe our services are the ones that are hard to reach. So looking to make sure that we're developing face-to-face -face interactions, choosing politically neutral spaces where people feel comfortable, and using diverse communication techniques that we were kind of shown from our CDC colleagues to make sure that there's multiple different ways that you're trying to approach a population and provide them the services uh, that are needed. And finally, we wanna make sure that we're making sure the process is accessible and meaningful. That there's focus on shared values, on making sure it's again the strength-based approach and understanding and coming in from humility and cultural responsiveness that you're trying to understand further the population's need. And you're make, really just making sure that you're cultivating community leaders, that you're really trying to both engage as many people as possible, as well as making sure that you're trying to see how you can either hire uh, certain members to be a part of the response efforts. And community engagement, as I mentioned, is not just at the health department level. Clinics and community-based organizations should be doing their work to build community advisory boards and other ways that you can create accountability mechanisms so the community can provide that feedback to the services you're, you're providing to make sure that it's reaching those who need to reach, as well as that you're achieving the goals that you've set out. Uh, next slide. Finally, we have a, a structural level, and there's four different areas that I want to key on, even though we could have a, a long conversation about this. And really thinking about areas such as institutional consistency, such as RL staff trained in cultural responsive care, knowing that the research shows that those who haven't been trained in cultural responsive care are more likely to provide stigmatizing behavior. Making sure that, as we mentioned earlier, hiring from the community, that those who provide services come from the communities we are trying to serve, and how can we make this process easier? Looking, for example, the Wisconsin program to hire black, gay, and bisexual men as part of a fellowship opportunity within the HIV and sexual health departments. Looking at our policies and guidelines in line with meeting the needs of marginalized persons. And this is uh, an example here is uh, NASTED's trauma-informed toolkit, which provides a lot of great resources around ensuring that your approaches that you're taking are informed with a trauma lens. And finally, our out outreach efforts prioritizing those most in need of services, and particularly when it comes to, say, hepatitis A and B vaccinations. You know, NASTED has a stigma toolkit that provides a number of resources to promote and talk about programming that meets the needs of Black and Latinx, gay and bisexual men, in terms of HAD, SCD, and other STDs. So there's a lot of different resources we would definitely be able to share um, when we send out all this information. Finally, can I have the last slide, please? You know, that was quite a good overview, and it really, uh, and NASA, just the point of this whole uh, five-minute conversation I wanted to have is just that there are plenty of different tools, briefs, resources, work groups, and more available to help continue these conversations. And if you need more information, there is a link to our website as well as I'm always happy to continue these conversations around um, health equity. We look forward to working with you all to find new best practices and innovative programs to really reach gay, bisexual, other men and sex men within the hepatitis response. With that, I'll turn it over back to Alyssa. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate that. And thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we have a little more time than I anticipated, but not a ton for questions. And I know a number have come in. So as I mentioned before, if we don't get to your questions, we will definitely be sure to follow up, but I have a few to get us started and feel free to share any in the chat box or in the questions that we can um, get to either now quickly or um, following the webinar. So one question that came in and I think a number of people could speak to the response to this is um, in regards to messaging around men who have sex with men, are we only concerned about men or should we be thinking about targeting anyone who engages in similar behavior, particularly the ones, um, Dr. Foster, you mentioned around uh, anal sex. And um, I think the big question here is really about different ways that members of the LGBT community identify and that message not being 
one that everyone or you know the MSM identity isn't one that everyone relates to and so making sure that we're reaching all the people who should be receiving their prevention messages. And sorry if that was a long question. I, I'm looking at questions in a number of different places and just want to make sure to get to them. Do you want me to repeat that or um, does that make sense? I think that would probably be a CDC question. And if anyone's talking, I think the lines are muted. Yeah. <laughs> it's Monique. Is the question more around how to message people who don't identify as gay and bisexual or more of what we recommend as far as protection or certain sexual practices? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I think it's around messaging just trying to make, like, how do you balance trying to reach populations who are most effective, affected, but also not miss folks who might not identify with certain identities like gay and bisexual men or MSM, but have similar risks? I mean, I think that um, Noel and many are Dr. Austin and Dr. Foster, you guys can um, say a little bit as well, but I think for us on the comms, it, it is a struggle that we have. And I think, um, you know, if you look at the way the recommendations are written, it's, it says men who have sex with men. And you know that that's not necessarily a, a moniker that people kind of associate with or kind of, you know, is a way to properly communicate. So for us, we, we did say gay and bisexual um, to try to be a little bit more encompassing. But I mean, I think we're always open to suggestions on how better to meet that mark. Um, and I think we also want to base it off on the size of what, you know, what the behaviors are that are really putting people at risk um, and, and why those um, recommendations are, are there. Thanks, Amanda. Amanda while you're on the line, we have a question about any resources that are geared towards the transgender community. So we don't have any materials specifically geared towards the transgender community. I think we're always open to hearing suggestions and needs, and that's something that you know we can get and discuss and see if CDC is the best um, suited to kind of address that, or if there's another organization that can provide um, information, but. I mean, I think that's really something that we could talk offline if, if there's a specific question. We just don't have any materials as of right now. Thank you. And Jasmine, I have a follow-up for Amanda, but I know you have a lot of questions that came in. Are there any really pressing or is it okay if I ask a follow-up about materials and communication? We do have a handful of questions, so I think there will be some follow-up afterwards. So please continue with yours. Okay, great, thank you. This will be quick and then we'll, we'll hopefully get to one more after that. But Amanda, I know you mentioned on your slide um, that CDC prioritizes stakeholder engagement in the development of materials and that you're always looking for um, different resources to what either create or if there are resources you can promote um, as well. And so just curious if you wouldn't mind sharing about what stakeholder engagement looks like and how CDC prioritizes um, ensuring that people from communities that you're developing resources for are involved in the process. Yeah, so with this, we did some extensive formative research. We did um, lit reviews. We also did some interviews with part, key partners and then also um, did interviews with um, a group of MSM as well. Um, and so that really put in a lot of information and planning into um, what our communication materials looked like. We also a little bit of informal testing of the materials. I think we're always into suggestions and, um, you know, I know a lot of people on the line probably work with this population and we would be very interested for your feedback and any information you have on how to make these materials um, better or there's materials that we're missing or there's gaps need to be filled and we're always open to having that conversation. So feel free to reach out to me at my email, um, which was on the slides. Thank you. And Jasmine, do you have any like lightning round questions to wrap up with? <laughs> I know. And if not, we can follow up afterwards. They're not quite lightning round. So we'll definitely take these into consideration and respond thoroughly. Okay, perfect. 
Well, I wanted to thank um, all of our speakers for sharing about the work and joining us for these presentations and everyone who is on the line. Uh, and definitely appreciate your patience with us not having enough time for Q&A at the end. But as we mentioned, we really wanna make sure that we follow up. So in addition to sending out the uh, recording and the slides, we'll send responses to your questions and link to the materials um, that we mentioned and that were presented on and then also email addresses so you can connect with folks as well. So thank you everyone for joining. And I also did want to mention that at the end, uh, an evaluation will pop up and we're always looking for um, feedback on our webinars and also ways that we can continue to support you all in your work. So if you want to take a couple minutes to share your thoughts and anything that we could do to support your work, we would greatly appreciate it. So thank you everyone so much for joining and we hope you have a great rest of your day.